Hello, welcome to Sky Sweaty Record Review, episode 191, the only first listen new music review show hosted by a French professor immediately after leaving the gym. So, the YouTube algorithms are being kinder to me, more people are watching the show, and that's great. And I'm going to be sort of going in between, like, reviewing well-known acts and unknown acts. Really, if you don't know, the point of this whole show is to answer the question, is there any good music out there? And, uh... I only answer yes, because I only review things that I like. And so I'm going to be reviewing an album called Hyper Vigilant by Stephen A. Clark. Not to be confused with Stephen A. Smith, the lackluster but amusing sports uh, commentator. Now, Stephen A. Clark. But before I get to this album, which I just love, it's crazy. It's crazy how much I like this record. I want to start with my only recurring feature, Professor Payne's Pretentious Preface. Uh, so let me talk to you about a technological trade-off that's happened. You see, I used to record music. I wasn't particularly good. I'm a much better music critic than I am a musician, which is often the case. So I'll let you determine how good my music could have possibly been based on how much you like me as a critic. Um, but when I recorded music, it was back in the early 2000s, late 90s. And, and back then, if you were a self-starter, you recorded on one of these puppies. This is a four track, a Tascam four track. You see, you'd put a cassette tape in there and there's two bands on each side of a cassette. So it would record on each of those and you'd mix everything down here onto that one track. And you could re-record, but basically what that meant was that you had very limited amount of stuff you could do. Now you could bounce tracks down to one so you could put theoretically infinite tracks onto a cassette, but that's very difficult and it requires locking in a mix. Like if you try to bounce down drums and bass, then you have to be sure that the sound is locked. How loud the drums are and how, bass, how loud the bass is, that just becomes one track all of a sudden. So this was the machine that basically all musicians use to record demos. Uh, very few artists actually released four-track demos. PJ Harvey uh, notoriously did. Um, but in general, this was what people used. And if you were an indie kid like me, uh, a guy with no distribution, no label, no fans, nothing other than just sort of sitting alone in my room thinking about myself, this was what you used to record. Now, that's dead. Dead as you could possibly be. Because, of course, we have computers. I should have taken out my laptop and been like, this is GarageBand, but you don't need to see that. You know, you know what's up, right? So now we have infinite tracks, infinite re-recording, infinite ability to capture anything that we want. And of course, what's lost in that is a certain amount of rawness. If you can re-record your vocals and just take half of one sentence and have it match with another version of that same singing, if you can just keep going and keep going, you end up losing a lot. You end up losing a lot in terms of emotion and feeling, I believe. But there's a trade-off, right? With that comes digital distribution. When I had this stupid thing, I couldn't distribute my music anywhere. I just, I, I burned this onto CDs and I made 20 copies of the CDs and gave it to my friends and half-heartedly gave it to indie labels. I'm kidding, I didn't give it to indie labels. I didn't give it to anybody. <laughs> I made like 20 copies of each of my CDs, which I spent hundreds of hours on, and then just gave them to my friends. If I were in today's day, I would have been able to put them on SoundCloud, put them on Tidal, I could have put them on Spotify, I could have done anything. So this is the question, is it possible that we can have the best of both worlds? And the answer is of course, <laughs> we just have to aim for it. We have to try to release music that has the rawness, the immediateness, the necessary restrictions of something like a four track, of old technology, and mix it with digital distribution. That is where we get to Stephen A. Clark's Excellent record, hypervigilant. You see, the whole thing could have been done on a four track. I don't think it was. I imagine it was used GarageBand or whatever, Eudora or whatever all those programs are called. Uh, but if you listen to it, I think it could all be done on a four track. All the drums, 100% of the drums are just a drum machine. Very simple, just right? No, nothing particularly fancy. Uh, there's some guitars, always good bass, 
and a vocal. Sometimes instead of a guitar, there'll be a keyboard, or sometimes there'll be keyboards kind of like swirling around. But in general, it is not a particularly super produced record. It feels like a four track demo. It has that immediacy. And the thing is, is that that immediacy, when done well, is better than just about anything else you can do in music, you know? I mean, in a way, I think you could take, you know, what Phoenix does and just producing perfect records that are perfectly produced. And that has its value. And then you have records like this, which are extremely raw, and they have, I would say, equal value, just in different ways. So what is this album about? What is it actually like? Well, it's called Hypervigilance. You know what I'm gonna do? First, I'm gonna do this. I'm going to play you some of, some of, the, some of the music, just to give you a, ch a chance to listen to it. I'll compare it to a bunch of other artists and let you know how the whole album goes, what the theme of the whole record is. I'll let you know, but first, let's give you a shot to listen. So I'm gonna play you the first track, which is the first one I heard, called I Hate Everything. This has a lot of the trademarks on this record. Um, the, the, the drums, you know, the, the drum machine, uh, the kind of interesting, strange singing. And what's interesting is this has a little bit of a self-help sample in the middle of it, like a self-help tape about being treated well and deserving to be treated well. So I'm just gonna play you that uh, right I'll now. Break is all I think about And this is how it feels I think probably a good place to start is I hope that you found that as interesting and engaging as I do. So the thing about this personal touch is that you feel really connected to this artist, very, very connected. <clears throat> and the choice of instrumentation, I think, is part of the reason why, at least for me. The fact that you have this drum machine going makes it feel like somebody just absolutely has to express themselves and needs to do it in a way that is completely direct. Um, what I pick up on, like, what I love about this is you can't really put genres on it. At times it feels like rock, at times it feels like soul. The, the artist actually reminds me the most of is the artist, formerly known as Prince, and then known as Prince again. Um, I don't, I'm not really sure exactly even why I feel so much that it reminds me of Prince. Maybe it's his singing approach. Maybe it's the fact that I get the sense that he's doing everything all by himself. I mean, I think he has to be. It feels like this could be like demos that Prince would record before recording the whole thing at times. Um, he doesn't have quite the vocal dynamism or the charisma, right? He's not trying to be like, you know, but I would sort of kind of put him in there and then maybe cross that with something like Kid Cudi, you know, like the sort of personal but slightly abstract, um, sort of like talented singing, but a little bit strained singing, you know, like not particularly like, uh, rehearsed or trained, but capable and engaging, I would sort of kind of put it between sort of those. And the thing that I hope you heard on that track is it's really, a, it's a breakup song. I hate everything. And then it says, about you. <laughs> and the whole album feels to me, and I hope I'm reading this correctly, of all the artists I've reviewed, I think this is the one I'd like to interview most. I find this record uh, really, really engaging. Um, so the song I Hate Everything just seems to be just a breakup song. Like, I hate everything about you. I deserve to be treated better. Good job, Stephen A. Clark, not Smith. Uh, good job, Stephen A. You deserve to be treated better. And then it leads in next, to the next song, Happiness. And this is great. This has this great movement. Um, at times it feels like kind of like sparse, but really full. It has like this kind of low... The first part of the verse is kind of low, and then it goes to this high part. And it's not really, I mean, it sounds 80s-ish, but I don't think it's trying to be, you know, particularly retro. Um, but it, it's just really an excellent track. Listening to these first two, that'd be my suggestion. You know, listen to I Hate Everything right into Happiness, and just give it, give it a shot, because the production is delightful, the kind of swirling keyboards and moving parts. 
And then the next track is uh, I Can't Change You. And so all of a sudden, we're starting to understand he's getting into an interesting territory here because this is a breakup album and it starts off very bitter, but we're going to see it's sort of a track, sort of an album about, I think, my prediction, this guy's in therapy. <laughs> And I think he's learning about himself and he's learning how to live. And I think he recorded on this four track or on the equivalent, the audacity equivalent of four track. And he's laying out his process of going through this breakup and self-realization with us, the listener. Because this track, I Can't Change You, is really kind of jealous. You know, it's like this emotional desperation. It has this sort of like lead line that's really kind of like stressed. He's sort of screaming at the end. You know, ah! you know, like, you know, at the end of Monster by Kanye, you know, just this sort of like, mm. and it leads into another angry song, Slugs. Slugs is either my favorite song or my least favorite song on the entire uh, record. It's sort of like his biggest swing. I don't know if it's his biggest miss. Um, he seems to be trying to make something catchy. Uh, this feels the most like a demo for perhaps somebody else, because it doesn't quite fit with the style of the rest of his stuff, but it's... It's interesting, every time you open your mouth, slugs come out. And I like that because you can imagine it's like slugs, or you can imagine it's like slugs from a, from a bullet. So either this person is disgusted by the person they're talking about, their ex, or they're thinking about how their ex was like shooting at them with their, with their words. Excellent track. Towards the end, it gets a little bit more soulful, like soul music. Uh, Karma is kind of an upbeat soul track. He starts singing a little bit more in falsetto. I think he has more range than he lets on, and I think he might actually sing less well than he can on purpose a lot on this record. I think to get that sense of immediacy. Um, Nothing in the End is this kind of gentle 80s-ish ballad, and then all of a sudden we're being led into a more vulnerable side where he's sort of expressing his disappointment with this relationship. You know, he's gone from like, I hate everything about you. You got slugs coming out of your mouth. And now he's like, we were supposed to be friends. So it's almost like reconciliation that then leads into Free Again, kind of a guitar song, maybe the least remarkable track on the album, but not a bad one. Maybe he's like, I'm free again. I can break free of this relationship. And then we go into Insecure World, which is another ballad, uh, these great echoey guitars. And it's cool because I think this is this kind of great therapy that this album is. He's talking about how he's sort of, I think he says, uh, I'm speaking out, but I'm speechless. Um, actually has kind of a Cure vibe to this. Maybe the echoey guitars and the, the, the way that he's singing it. Um, and then he says, the only way out is through forgiveness. So here we go. We've gone the whole gambit from like, I hate everything about you to the only way out is through forgiveness. And he sort of implies that whatever it is that, that caused this breakup uh, with his ex is insecurity. That the person he's singing about was insecure. And that led to whatever it is that he's feeling now. And also that he's insecure. So perhaps the whole thing is a comment on the nature of insecurity. Perhaps the whole thing is like this great track about a relationship that breaks up and in a very human way, he's able to express it. I should also mention there's sort of like a hidden track at the end where he's like singing about taking the bullets out of somebody's chest and seeing them when he closes his eyes. It's like an elegy for somebody who died. I don't know why that's on this album. It doesn't fit with the rest. I hope it's an opening and then his next album is going to be about that and processing his grief through there. I don't know. So there you go. I've been, I've been watching a lot of uh, Rick Beato, Beato, I don't know how you pronounce it. Uh, he's a, sort of a music critic who does interesting stuff, a talented musician. He's from Rochester. Um, and uh, he talks a lot about like soul and where soul has gone in music and where like imperfections, how important imperfections are to music. And this album is a great example of how the technology, which can take that away, you know, with auto-tune and with the ability to make drum beats perfect, you know, um, that you can actually overcome that. If you're a good enough artist, you can overcome it. There's enough imperfections on this record. There's enough feeling and soul. And it goes, was recorded on and processed through and distributed through the computer, which allegedly killed rock and roll and allegedly killed soul. So there is hope. 
All right, so there is Stephen A. Clark's Hypervigilant, a very, very strong recommendation if you liked what you heard. If you didn't like what you heard, if you're like, eh, it's too, it's too, uh, it's too personal, it's too raw, that's cool. All right, until next time, where I'll be reviewing another probably very personal album by somebody with their first name. I don't know. There's the camera. Oh, and for this old helmet that my brother used to have. I don't know why he bought it. It's kind of cool, though. There's the camera.